Bueno, buenos, buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos a, a esta mesa redonda en torno al libro del profesor eh, Walu Chao, intitulado A Common Law Theory of Judicial Review. Eh, lo comentamos aquí entre los participantes y la idea es que el profesor Walu Chao exponga en unos 20 minutos la línea argumentativa de su trabajo y después pasamos a los comentarios de, de los, de los eh, profesores eh, aquí presentes en el, en el presidium. Eh, el profesor eh, Will Wallow Chao es eh, profesor en la Universidad de McMaster, eh, en el Departamento de Filosofía del Derecho. Eh, es una persona que se ha dedicado a los temas de positivismo jurídico desde la perspectiva analítica. Eh, tiene un libro muy importante, eh, eh, publicado por Oxford University Press intitulado Inclusive Legal Positivism que es el positivismo jurídico incluyente y es uno de los máximos representantes de este positivismo un tema que trabajó con el profesor eh, Hart y precisamente este es su, su nuevo libro eh, sobre constitucionalismo que, que viene amablemente a presentar aquí al instituto Well, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here again in Mexico UNAM uh, It's always great to to hear what you have to say in these issues of jurisprudence and present your new, new your new book, A Common Law Theory of Judicial Review. I was telling the audience that the idea is to uh, start with a 20-minute presentation on your part, sketch out the arguments of the book, and then I'll open it up for comments to the rest of the professors. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Juan. Um, First, I'd like to thank you for inviting me back. Uh, it's my third time here now, and it's becoming to seem, it's, it's, it seems like a second home now. Uh, and uh, I always enjoy my time here, and I learn a lot, and uh, people are wonderful, and I'd like to thank you all for, for inviting me. Many people think that uh, charters are bills of rights, and I'm going to talk about charters of rights to encompass, I'm going to use that term to encompass um, any kind of constitutional instrument that Uh, entrenches fundamental rights. Many people think that charters or bills of rights are good things to have. For example, they are often applauded for their help in protecting vulnerable minorities and individuals and for their role in securing fundamental liberal rights essential to a thriving democracy. But charters are not without their detractors. Indeed, the chorus of critics seems to be swelling, at least in Canada, As Canadian courts continue to struggle with the immense political power their charter appears to give them. Now, my principal aim in uh, a common law theory of judicial review, the living tree, uh, was to answer these critics by defending both charters of rights and the practices of judicial review to which they normally give rise against a number of objections that have been made against them. And in answering those critics, I take some initial steps toward developing an alternative to, the, to what I think is the shared understanding of charters, which underlies both the objections as well as the rival view of those, at least many of them, who argue in favor of charters. So, so, so the critics and the people who advocate in favor of charters seem to have a shared picture of, of the nature and role of a charter. And in particular, I set out to challenge what I think is the picture shared by most critics and advocates concerning the role a charter is supposed to play in legal and political practices. Now, that role is one of providing a more or less stable, fixed, sorry, providing more or less stable, fixed points of agreement on and pre-commitment to moral limits on government power. Limits expressed in, for example, and here I'm going to just use Canadian examples, Section 15 of the Canadian Charter, which seeks to guarantee the right to equality, or Section 2, which aims to secure the right to free expression. And the Canadian Charter says that any, any act of legislation or uh, any, any kind of official government act which violates one of these rights is to the extent of the violation of no force or effect. In other words, not a valid law at all. Now, charter advocates submit that such stable fixed points of limitation are not only possible, 
despite some acknowledged measure of disagreement and controversy about their precise content, and despite the inevitable changes to our understanding of them which occur over time. They also argue that such limits are for a variety of different reasons, and here we hear things like the protection from Mill's tyranny of the majority, from mass hysteria in times of national crises, or from simple moral blindness, that for a variety of reasons such as those, the uh, charters are, it's morally and politically desirable to have charters, perhaps even essential in a modern, thriving democracy. Now, charter critics, on the other hand, view all this as deeply mistaken and dangerous. For example, many argue that the agreement and pre-commitment presupposed by these, by the advocates' defense of charters simply don't exist within what Jeremy Waldron aptly terms the circumstances of politics. These circumstances include, for Waldron, not only the, the, the desire to act in concert politically and in ways which do not infringe fundamental rights of individuals, but also, and importantly, radical, dis radical dissensus or disagreement about how we should go about achieving that objective. Uh, a disagreement grounded in deep dissensus over what our fundamental moral rights actually are and how they are best understood and applied in concrete cases. This is especially so, it's argued, in multicultural societies, such as we have in Canada, United States, and perhaps to some extent in Mexico. Now, according to Waldron, quote, it looks as though it's disagreement all the way down so far as constitutional choice is concerned. That's the end of the quotation. But if a nation's population cannot agree at any particular moment in time, let alone across generations, on the precise contents of the moral rights it wishes to enshrine in its constitutional charter, it cannot intelligibly pre-commit to this stable fixed point of constitutional limits they supposedly represent. Instead of a relatively stable fixed point of pre-commitment, imposed by the people themselves upon their representatives in the legislature and enforced in a supposedly objective, morally neutral manner by judges, a community will, in adopting a charter, have foolishly extended an open-ended invitation to these unelected, unaccountable judges to impose their own biased, unprincipled and arbitrary constraints upon the people's very own right to self-determination. And whatever, whatever else might be said about this kind of arrangement, it cannot possibly be squared with the ideals of democracy. Now, even if at some moment in time when the decision is taken to entrench a set of charter rights in a constitution, one, even if at that moment in time one had miraculously somehow achieves complete agreement among judges, legislators, and the community at large on which rights to include in the Charter and how these are to be interpreted and applied in all known cases, the simple fact of the matter is that in a very short period of time, a good number of people, perhaps even a majority, will inevitably disagree with many of the previously agreed answers. And when that time comes, which it most certainly will, the following question will stand in need of answer. The question being, why should the people now be bound by what the people then agreed were the correct constitutional restraints to place on the powers of government? How can this possibly be squared, the critics will say, with the ideals of autonomy and continuous self-government which lie at the heart of our democratic commitments. Now, if that shared picture of the role a charter is supposed to play is accepted, then in my view, it seems to me that the game is pretty much over and the critics uh, can be declared the victors. There are, it seems, seems to me at any rate, just too many serious objections to that standard picture I just sketched and no obvious means of addressing them adequately, despite the, the uh, well-intentioned efforts of, of a lot of people to try to deal with them. So, instead of attempting to answer the critics on the terms set by that picture, 
What I do in the book is try to defend an entirely different view of the role we can sensibly ask charters and our judges to play. On that rival view, charters are far from aspiring to set these mysterious fixed points of agreement and recommitment. And importantly, they do not presuppose the level of confidence in the rectitude of our moral judgments about rights naively presupposed in that standard picture I just sketched. On the contrary, charters are, can be viewed as what I call living trees, representing a mixture of only very modest pre-commitment combined with a considerable measure of humility regarding our epistemic and moral limitations. The humility stems largely from recognition that none of us, including our legislators, and perhaps most, most importantly our legislators, none of us has all the right answers when it comes to moral rights and their implications. And from the belief that we are wise to design our political and legal institutions in ways which are sensitive to that feature of our predicament. Now, once we see charters and the practices of judicial review to which they characteristically give rise in this very different light, I think, we can not only see why they might be good things to have, we can also see our way clear to answering the critics of charters and judicial review. So that's the general theme and argument of the book. I'd like now to provide a thumbnail sketch of how I go about developing them in the book. I begin with some initial thoughts on the nature of democracy, of representation, particularly democratic representation, of the nature of constitutionally limited government, what that means and what it can possibly be, focusing in particular on the pros and cons of entrenching a written constitution with a charter and giving judges the task of enforcing its limits against unwarranted exercises of government power principally by a legislature. I then move on to explore critically some of the standard arguments in favor of constitutional charters of rights and judicial review that one, that one encounters both in academic discourse and also in popular discourse. Now this amalgam of arguments I call the standard case, the standard case that's made in favor of charters. Now following an assessment, a critical assessment of the standard case, the critics' case against charters and the associated practices of judicial review is, is outlined, and I subject that to, to preliminary examination. And my principal aim at that point is to demonstrate that the rhetoric employed by the critics, more often than not, outstrips the logic of their arguments. But an equally important goal is to reveal the points at which the critics have got things more or less right. I'm very sympathetic to, so, to many of the arguments that the critics make. Oftentimes, and once the rhetorical flourishes are cleared away, there's a good deal of substance in the criticisms that have been made. More often than not, the critics have rightly pointed out the considerable gulf between the reality of life under a charter of rights and the rosy picture embraced by its most ardent defenders. The simple fact, I think, is that a charter cannot do what many of its advocates maintain. It cannot, for example, possibly live up to the ideal of letting citizens know beforehand and with confidence exactly what their moral rights against government are, and of representing a society's guarantee of pre-commitment to its members, particularly its minority members, that the agreed rights will be observed and respected in subsequent government action. The critics are, I think, correct. There's nothing but trouble in the notion that we have pre-committed to the guaranteed observance of a right when we have little agreement on what that right amounts to. We certainly cannot guarantee that, and here I'm, I'm going to quote you, can't guarantee that citizens know exactly what their rights and freedoms are. End of quote. That's a quotation from former Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, who once said that in relation to the newly minted Canadian Charter. I thought that was, one of the, that was one of the obvious appeals of the Canadian Charter. It guaranteed that citizens knew exactly what their rights were. That can't happen if we radically disagree 
and, fu uh, and fundamentally about the concrete implications of our charter rights for individual cases and individual issues that are going to arise. But these are serious problems, I submit, only if we accept the fixed commitment picture of charters in constitutional uh, review I described a little bit earlier. However, that picture is, I think, both flawed and highly misleading. And seeing why and to what extent that is allows us to achieve a better understanding of what we can reasonably ask a charter to do for us. Now, the, the alternative I defend, I call the common law conception. That's why the book is called The Common Law Theory of Judicial Review. The common law conception takes its inspiration from two sources. First, and perhaps most importantly, the penetrating analysis of H.L.A. Hart, whose thoughts on the move from a pre-legal to a legal world, that he sketches in, in his classic book, The Concept of Law, and, importantly, the inherent limits and dangers of the rule of law, something else Hart develops in the concept of law, these elements provide fertile grounds, I think, for constructing a better understanding of charters than the standard fixed commitment conception that I outlined at the start. That's the first source. The second source is an idea articulated long ago by an English judge, Lord Sankey, in in, in a case called Edwards. And that case is a landmark Canadian constitutional case, because back in our uh, colonial past, the English House of the English Privy Council was actually our final court of appeal. So even though it was decided by an English judge, or, or sorry, a group of English judges, it's a, it's a landmark Canadian case. Edwards is a, is a landmark Canadian constitutional case decided by the, the British Privy, Privy Council in 1930. And it's now commonly referred to as the person's case. Now, that case, Edwards, is notable for two reasons. First, and remember this is 1930, it established for the first time in Canadian legal history that women are indeed persons for purposes of appointment to the Senate. Up till that point, women in Canada were not considered persons. And two, and perhaps most importantly for my purposes, it introduced into Canadian constitutional law the living tree metaphor, which, following Edwards, has been repeatedly endorsed by the Canadian courts in a string of important charter cases. Now, on that conception, constitutions, and hence those charters which enjoy constitutional status, in no way represent attempts to establish fixed points of agreement uh, and free commitment. On the contrary, a charter is, and here I'm quoting Lord Sankey from the Edwards Judgment, to be viewed as a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits. In other words, limits inherent in its constitutional role. It's an instrument which must be allowed to grow and adapt, Sankey said, to new contemporary circumstances and evolving normative beliefs, including beliefs about justice and rights in this case, justice and rights concerning women. Now, many critics follow Jeremy Waldron in taking it to be a decisive objection to charters that we lose, and here I'm quoting Waldron, our ability to evolve a free and flexible discourse of politics, a discourse which is essential for ongoing democratic self-rule, and which can more easily involve, if instead of relying on written charters to guarantee our rights, we rely for rights protection on, again quoting Waldron, legal recognition in the form of common law principles and precedents. Or, he goes on to add, conventional understandings subscribed to in the community, political community at large. That's the end of the quotations from Waldron. Now, my living tree conception attempts to bring these two approaches together into a kind of common law understanding of written charters one which seeks to unite the fixity of entrenched written law with the disciplined adaptability characteristic of the common law and its reliance on precedent and case-by-case -case reasoning. My main argument in the book is that in adopting a charter, treated as the living tree common law conception rec recommends, that in doing that, we are able to reap many of the benefits 
for which charters are usually promoted by, by their advocates, while avoiding most, if not all, of the critics' most powerful complaints. Let me say a few more words about this common law conception of charters. As I noted a moment ago, it highlights the fact that we do not know in advance what our concrete moral rights and freedoms are, or will be in many instances, and that we do well in designing our systems of political and legal governance to set things up so that we can be morally and rationally responsive to this unavoidable feature of our human predicament. It's what I call the circumstances of rulemaking. One of the ways in which this lack of moral insight can play out in practice is the unintended violation of someone's moral rights by an act of legislation. Often legislators simply cannot know when they introduce legislation, whether and to what extent their otherwise justifiable exercise, sorry, their otherwise justifiable legislative efforts might reasonably be held later to compromise fundamental standards of morality and rationality. Despite their best efforts, this is going to happen. As Hart noted long ago, legal systems are typically sensitive to this feature of our human predicament and employ a number of different measures to accommodate it. These include, paradigmatically, the employment in general legislation of abstract terms like reasonable and fair. Instead of trying to determine in advance, but in the dark, what is fair or reasonable in the countless unforeseen cases which, which might arise, legal systems often leave this determination to our discretion. Leave it to us to determine what's fair or reasonable, and importantly, the subsequent discretion of judges, who may be called upon later to assess our decisions in this respect. Now, when they do so, judges typically employ a common law case-by-case -case methodology where cases are compared, precedents are distinguished, and general but perpetually revisable rules, principles, and standards begin to emerge over time. What degree of force is reasonable in responding to a threat to our person or property? Well, given the myriad circumstances in which such, such threats might arise, it would, I think, be sheer folly to attempt to, to define concretely in advance and for every conceivable future case what a reasonable degree of force might be. So legal systems typically do not try to nail this all down in advance. Rather, they simply tell us that we may use reasonable force. And then, le and then they leave it to us to figure out, with the help of common understandings within the community, previous judicial rulings and the principles and standards to which they give rise, what would be a reasonable amount of force to use in our particular circumstances. And the system then relies on judges to evaluate our decisions. Now, quite often, that is the only sensible way to proceed even though a person might reasonably complain that it would have been a bit more reassuring to know in advance what precisely would be expected of him. Now, these and other such te techniques are all used by the law in dealing with our unavoidable lack of foreknowledge about many of the situations in which we're going to find ourselves. Now, my argument is that the adoption of a charter viewed along these lines is one such technique. A charter can, I think, be viewed as a flexible device for dealing with our epistemic limitations with respect to the effects of government action, most notably legislative action, on our moral rights. Now, these are moral rights whose precise content and concrete implications we cannot know and agree upon in advance, but whose vital importance we recognize in our decision to entrench them in a charter of rights. Just as we cannot always predict what will amount to a reasonable, to reasonable force, legislators cannot, cannot always predict what will, in a particular set of circumstances, amount to a violation of someone's right to equality or her right to express herself freely. Now, the law reasonably and responsibly, I think, responds to the former problem, degree of force case, by specifying an abstract right to reasonable force and then leaving it to us 
and the courts later to determine its contours on a case-by-case basis. In much the same way, I argue, our political system reasonably responds to the latter problem. What, what impact is legislation going to have on our moral rights? By entrenching fundamental abstract rights to equality, free expression, life, liberty, and so on, and leaving their concrete understanding and the implications they have for, among other things, legislation, to be worked out on a similar basis. Now, once we see charters and judicial review as, as implementing that process in this very different light, we can, I submit, see our way clear not only to a better understanding of the disputes between charter critics and advocates, it puts it in a whole different light, we can also see, I argue in the book, why charters and judicial review can be very good things to have. Even in a multicultural society, fully committed to the ideals of democracy and subject to the endless disputes caused in part by our epistemic and moral limitations. That, at any rate, is the burden of my argument in the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Um, desafortunately, no tenemos eh, traducción de, de el, del, del evento y, y también los otros ponentes van a, van a, a formular sus, sus comentarios en inglés. Eh, les pido paciencia y si quieren ahí poco podemos al final este, eh, fijar los puntos de debate en español por si algunos de ustedes tienen comentarios, pero sin más, entonces le, le doy la palabra al doctor Enrique Cáceres Nieto. Eh, para que exponga sus, sus comentarios eh, él se, desafortunadamente tiene que retirarse un poco temprano por eso nos está pidiendo que, que inicie con, la, eh, con los comentarios Enrique eh, Muchísimas gracias eh, Lo que trataría de hacer es presentar algunas consideraciones tratando de naturalizar argumentos del debate por naturalizar un argumento entenderé Tratar de considerar los méritos de un argumento y contraargumento no únicamente desde una perspectiva meramente especulativa, es decir, que racionalmente estén construidos y bien armados, sino una serie de test adicional proveniente de una consideración próxima a la que se genera desde el punto de vista de las ciencias, sin asumir que las ciencias dan cuenta de la objetividad del valor absoluto. Esto es lo que, sobre lo que versará la plática que me voy a permitir, el comentario que me voy a permitir hacer. The overview of the conference is the following. Later like introduction, some background of the comment, some legal constructive considerations, and the consideration about the naturalized arguments presented by Professor Wallison. Okay, in addition, on this occasion I will make a comment on the Wallershaw Waldron debate that can be found in Professor Wallershaw's book entitled A Common Law Theory of the Judicial Review. I will approach the debate from a, what's being called a naturalized jurisprudence perspective by way of naturalizing the arguments offered by the parties involved. By naturalizing an argument, I understand the activity of examining the argument of the thesis in question in light of the most recent development reported in the field of cognitive science research, and not only in an speculative way. At this point, I wish, I wish to deal very briefly with a possible objection that I might be confusing different kinds of knowledge, that is, scientific and philosophical. To those who subscribe to this critique, I said that my attempt for naturalizing the jurisprudential debate in which some kinds of reasoning, judicial reasoning, is involved, has the same epistemological justification of contemporary philosophy of mind, which for its part necessarily has to take into account the ongoing research in the field of cognitive neurosciences. Background of my comment. 
The research I am currently conducting is located in the field of applied legal epistemology and precisely in the field of artificial intelligence and law. Its main objective is to develop a judicial decisional support system. Nevertheless, the most important aspect of the research, at least the most relevant for our present purposes, has to do with eliciting and representing the cognitive processes carried out by real expert judges when they solve disputed legal cases. I think that some light can be shed out of the results obtained of this macrocognitive investigation. Some legal constructivism lessons. I will present a structure of arguments with the follow strategy. I will use uh, the cross for represent defeated arguments, and view supported arguments, interrogation non-conclusive arguments, the circle prodandum, and the square supportive reasons. Okay. So legal constructivism lessons. A. Regarding the alleged deep differences between common law and Roman law systems. Apparent more than real are the alleged deep differences among these systems. In both scenarios, the difficult situation, pointed by Hart and again by Wallachow, of combining some degree of fixity with flexibility has to be dealt with. The common law system's flexible side of the story, reciting the doctrine of precedent, which can also be said of Roman law systems like Mexico, where the presidents of the Supreme Court of Justice are legally bonding to lower-ranked courts. The Roman law system's fixity side of the story comes in the way of the preponderant role of legislation. The common law equivalent of this picture is its statutory law and charters in trending constitutions of some Anglo-Saxon countries. Whether they are common law or Roman law legal operators, they share a cognitive toolkit that allows them to process written law inputs and customary law inputs. B. The cognitive system as a dynamic, self-organizing, an evolving device, naturalizing Waldron's argument about the rigidity of charters. From a constructivistic stance, cognition subjects are seen as information processing devices. Cognitive psychology research has shown that a huge amount of those processes are carried out by the so-called adaptive unconscious. The evolving property of the cognitive system operates by way of establishing analogies with prior similar situations. This property is at work when we face new problematic scenarios by adapting previously developed problem-solving strategies. When Waldron's argument that the obsession of having great charters constitutes an obstacle to the legal system's flexibility is naturalized, it becomes unsupported. On grounds of our biological design, the adaptive properties of our cognitive system mandate the evolution, constant change of the cognitive schemes, through which we understand and comprehend the world and by means of which we solve practical problems. These adaptive properties precisely constitute the cognitive basis for the evolution of language and of our moral and political practices. So, even though we have written charters insured in constitutional documents, their application and protection by judges is not already fixed. Every time, a solution is called for a practical problem where the application or protection for some fundamental right is involved, adaptive and conscious structures are at play. The mind as a collective product naturalizing the argument of the judge's subjectivity. <clears throat> Studies carried out by the Russian constructivist Lev Vygotsky show that our mental life is constituted by the interactions we have with the world, but fundamentally by our interactions with other actors conforming the different social networks in which we are socialized. In the same line, Gregory Bateson said, that we find ourselves having different contextual identities 
which are related to the context of interaction of play. The contextual identity that we would assume in a solemn ceremony of graduation is different from the one we could assume in the celebration party that comes after. From this perspective, it becomes clear that judges' minds are shaped by the symbolic universe which is characteristic of their community of reference. The influence of the symbolic universe in which they have been socialized is of un if no unconscious control. The judicial community performs the function of being an intersubjective means that restricts and controls judges' content attribution practices to legal norms. Walls don't worry that we assume a great risk with judicial review due to judge's subjectivity has no ground. Unless she is thinking on a judge that has not been socialized in a judicial community, which is absurd. Wallishop's well, argument that judicial activity falls sometimes discretionary is not arbitrary due to the fact that it follows the rule of the game established in a broader legal community are better supported and consistent with cognitive research. Cognitive schemes stored in memory determine the future development of adaptive cognitive structures, naturalizing Wallachow's analogy of the law as a living tree. Recent studies show that cognitive structures already available to the cognizant subject determine the content and meaning that can be assigned to new information. In fact, our natural tendency is to try to interpret the world in a way that is consistent with the cognitive structures that prior experiences gave rise to. The Tetrix game is a good metaphor for explaining the way in which the configuration, shape, or the previous structures determine the way in which the new structures will match. One Wallachow's metaphor of the living tree has been naturalized. Considering the described cognitive properties, it becomes plainly justified. The abstract and open textual terms employed in grids and charters are the cognitive equivalent to the initial structures of the Tetrix game. They constitute the point of departure for the future elaboration of legal norms. Constitutional morality and information cognitive processing rules. Establishing the standard of good performance when determ determining legal content and applying legal rules has been the goal of prescriptive ethics and of some schools of legal reasoning. As for legal positives, this in Roman law systems concerns, those standards have to do with favoring almost all the time the literal meaning of the language employed in legal discourse. Nonetheless, empirical studies about the cognitive inputs that processing of which gives rise to the cognitive schemes through which judges determine the law, reveal that the cognitive inputs taken into account by the judges are of the most diverse kinds. Cultural prejudices, from which certain shared social beliefs emerge, the balance of economic reasons where the judge evaluates her chance of survival within the institutional context, personal or group's agendas that will determine the content for decision, etc. Within this complex multivariable system of inputs, legal and moral rules are variables along with lots of other options. Based on this, it is not clear that constitutional morality and reflexive equilibrium can necessarily have the preponderant and decisive role as a cognitive input for the judges when determining legal content that are attributed by Professor Wallershaw. At this stage of the wallershaw wardroom debate, the question remains open. An answer may come by considering that the relative weight and preponderance these inputs have, the elements of the constitutional morality and reflexive equilibrium, 
depends upon the consideration of the entire relevant factors at play in the ongoing legal political system in which judicial operators are involved. That's all. Thank you. Gracias, doctor Cáceres. Eh, Inver. Dear Will, I am glad to have you here in Mexico again, and I'm, I, I'm sure I'm talking for my UNAM friends. We are very glad to have you here. Eh, I have entitled this The Living Tree, Fixity and Flexibility, a General Theory of Constitutional Democracy. Taking the Constitution and the Charter rights seriously is one of the aims of Wilfrid Waller Show's A Common Law Theory of Judicial Review, The Living Tree. And taking the claims of this book seriously is one of the ambitions of mine for this roundtable and hearing after. As Jules Byrne might put it, at least for 80 days around the world. Clearly, in this case, you are a Canadian version of Phileas Fogg, in this case, Phileas Hockey, and, my, and me, a Mexican issue of Path Part 2. Literally, pasa por todo, passes for everything. I will be uh, uh, praising your metaphor and the, the structure of the book, and then I will be criticizing uh, one part of it. And first, I applaud the living tree metaphor as drawing the picture of a living constitution beyond the given portrait of a dynamic constitution. A distinction is helpful here. Although living beings think and non-living beings think can be dynamic, the latter are more limited than the former. For instance, a functioning machine can be set in motion and stopped, turn off, turn on, by someone or something in more or less expected and foreseen ways. Whereas a living organism has a life of its own and hence is capable of reacting in different and at some point unexpected and unforeseen ways. If one views a constitution as a living tree that grows and adapts to contemporary circumstances, trends, and beliefs, and whose current and continued authority rests on its justice or on factors like the consent, commitment, or sovereignty of the people now, not the framers of the people then. In short, it is a tree that is very much alive, and I might add, I'm kicking. A living thing capable of organic growth, a tree which has roots already stable and fixed, or entrenched and written, and adaptable and flexible branches to be continuously fixed and refixed, or to be entrenched and to be written, and if you want, to be re-entrenched and rewritten. Let me advance that the living tree metaphor was introduced, as you said, in Edwards, the Attorney General of Canada. Anyway. Let me advance that the living tree metaphor was introduced in Edwards versus Attorney General of Canada, also known as the Persons case, which was decided in ancient theory by the Private Council of the United Kingdom, as you pointed out, and recognized for Canadians in Canadian law most of the rights, and which recognized for Canadians in Canadian law most of the rights included now in the Charter, long before its introduction in 1982. At some other point in time, I intend to develop from this fact an argument against your inclusive legal positivism. By the by, congratulations on the first 25 years of your constitution. I admire, secondly, I admire the way you frame the debate, not only by introduce, introducing helpful distinctions, but also by presenting the debate itself. On the one hand, and then I am certain that your analytical, critical distinctions are quite helpful to understand the importance of the debate. Rex Regina, sovereign government, limited, unlimited, constitutional law, constitutional convention, procedural convention, conception of democracy, constitutional conception of democracy, regas, demos, Hercules Ulysses, which you relabel here, Atticus, on behalf of Atticus Finch, the charter of the fictional novel to kill the Mockingbird, a lawyer brutally honest, highly moral, and a tireless crusader for good causes, even hopeless ones. I have the fear that our legislators are not like Atticus Finch. <laughs> Express wishes best interest. Authentic genuine wishes and authentic not genuine ones. Top down, bottom up mythologies, people then, people now, and so on. 
On the other hand, I am confident that you did an extensive and exhaustive analysis and criticism of all the arguments, claims, examples, and objections, as well as the counter-examples, counter-arguments, counter-claims, and counter-objections already made and to be made by both the advocates and the critics of written and French charters and judicial review, such as Ronald Dworkin and Jeremy Walker, correspondingly. It is hard to imagine even one single argument, claim, example, or objection, and their respective counter-argument, counter-claim, counter-example, or counter-objection left out, made by them or any other authors I can imagine. Let me point out that after the brilliant exposition of the debate and the critics' case, you start a no less brilliant exploration of the possible routes for an ongoing debate. Instead of touching past each other, as not trade of thwart what has been imposed onto the road ahead, you decide courageously, instead of taking a long detour or a shortcut, taking you nowhere, to face the dangers and obstructions blocking the road ahead. Instead of abandoning entrenched written charges and judicial review altogether as well done claims, or at least partially, as Tom Campbell suggested last year, by adopting a legislative deal of rights to be enforced not by courts but by legislatures, you develop an alternative, alternative to it, which constitutes a better understanding of the roles of charters and judicial review in a constitutional democracy. I, I move to the part, to the critical part. Third, I agree with almost everything you said in the six chapters of your book, including your conclusions, but I have a small problem with one of your premises. You might even think that it is a conclusion in itself. My feeling is that this premise conclusion is unnecessary for your main objective, and you can easily get rid of it. I refer mainly to your fifth chapter, or at least to something within its core. As you can see, it is not truly a small, but a big problem. My hunch is that throughout the book, you have been formulating powerful arguments, not only for a better understanding of charters and judicial review in a representative democracy, or for those having a procedural conception of democracy, but also for limited government in a constitutional democracy or for those holding a constitutional conception of democracy, where both legislation and education, legislatures and courts, legislators and judges are compatible with the respective limits and powers, not, mer not, sorry, not merely functioning, but coexisting in a division of labor as complementary and not merely by controlling each other. In addition, and even more, more precisely, the problem I see is with circumscribing your alternative to the common law methodology, which you characterize as bottom-up one, suggesting that it is possible to revise charter rights by judicial review at the point of their application to meet the challenge that disagreement comes all the way down, as Waldron put it. Your move echoes the center middle move made famous by HLA Hart, which resembles Aristotle's middle term. Let me rephrase it. Common law reasoning is revisable at the point of application, whereas the statutory law in French and written is not. Charter rights, which resemble fixed statutory law in the sense that they are in French and written, requires a flexible application similar to the one of common law. Hence, the common law methodology is your way out, your way up to face disagreement all the way down. My gut feeling is that this is hardly the case. It might be the case for an, for an unentrenched and unwritten bill of rights, construct all the way up by judges, but not to an entrenched, entrenched written one. Keep in mind that charter rights are nowadays both entrenched and written, mostly, and enforced not only in common law countries with common law methodology, but a different methodology in non-common law countries, such as the civil ones such as Colombia, Germany, Italy, Spain, and for that purpose, I would say Mexico, but also in the rest of the world, and even by regional courts on human rights, such as the European, the Inter-American, and the African. Besides, I can hardly imagine Jeremy or Ronnie, non, uh, or Ronnie not coming after you for that move. Jeremy, Jeremy might ask, and what about the legislators? And Ronnie, what about my constitutional interpretation? To sum up, my claim is that the living tree is not a common law theory of judicial review, since, this, since it is much more than that. It is a general theory of constitutional democracy. On one side, it is a general theory and a methodology beyond the boundaries of the common law system, and it is bottom-up methodology. And on the other 
it is not limited to the role that courts and judges play in judicial review, but to the role in a constitutional democracy and its compatibility with the one played not only by legislators and legislators, but also by anyone, including legal officials and citizens. I can easily imagine you answering to my object objections by saying that you are interested in de developing a common law theory of judicial review for common law countries, or, uh, or uh, and not a general theory, nor to be applied to constitutional democracies. But I don't think that's, that was your aim. I move to, to my alternative. My alternative following your Hartian move can also be labeled as occupying the center middle. We start, we start with the interpretation of the text as fixed, entrenched, and written charters of right, something like statutory law, top-down methodology, and then we confront it, this is one line, and then we confront it at the point of application with something like the common law bottom-up methodology. Clearly, it is neither all the way down statutory law application, nor all the way up common law revision at the point of application. It is a different methodology, one that requires a meeting point, as the one provided in Chapter 6, finding the community's constitutional morality by using something like roles reflected equilibrium. One part of which is already fixed as a sort of commitment, but drafted in open texture and back terms, by the way, flexible which required to be fixed, adapted from time to time on case-by-case -case scenarios by courts and judges. But, but it can also leave space for legislators and legislators to play a key role in other stages of the political process. And as Godwin says, in the circumstances of politics. I have in mind, and you, in, and you introduced those in, in your book, the Canada section on uh, section 33, the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, sections four and seven, and uh, I can point out the Mexico's Article 72, Fraction F of the Federal Constitution, which allows this sort of legislative interpretation. And even I can point to the 8th, 11th requirement of Article 105 of the Constitution to give a general, the general derogatory effect in judicial review in Mexico, or to the two-third requirement for constitutional amendments. Somehow, I can imagine easily having the legislatures pass in legislation with 50% plus one of the votes. It can easily be vetoed by the president, or at some point vetoed by the president, but then we can also have constitutional amendments passed by two-thirds, that's 66.66%, that cannot be vetoed by the president, they are already over override. We can also take this, the, the Mexican constitutional ju judicial review with general effects, only once the 8 11 are met, that's 72.72%. And I can easily keep going, and I think that that was your aim, uh, for new stages of legislation, for new constitutional amendments, uh, the different cases of Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board of Education, and all the different cases you cite can help you move into that stage. I have the feeling that, for instance, the, the different cases in Mexico, including gay unions, uh, abortion, uh, cases for Chiapas, Michoacan, and Oaxaca, recent electoral reforms. Uh, for instance, in the case of Michoacan, the court uh, overruled the, uh, a bill, and they have to redo the bill, and they pass it along, and now it's forced. So it's, uh, I, I guess I, I can keep going with examples of that sort, but uh, I will close with, with this briefly idea. Uh, if I am right, with my friendly amendment, you will be on track again with a general theory of constitutional democracy. If I'm wrong, I will be merely an idiot trying to help someone else to tie himself to the mask. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias al profesor Imar Flores, eh, Francisco Ibarra. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Quiero en primer lugar agradecer a, a Juan Vega eh, su invitación y eh, al doctor Fitzgerald por acompañarnos y, y tenernos en este recinto. A la coordinación del posgrado en Derecho, eh, gracias a cuyos eh, financiamientos el profesor Gualucho nos acompaña. Y eh, yo quisiera eh, eh, pedir autorización para a Juan Vega y al profesor Gualucho para leer en inglés inmediatamente eh, 
Y hacer una breve traducción al español por aquellas personas que no tengan el dominio del idioma. Si ustedes me permiten, no me llevaría mucho tiempo. Eh, ¿Sí? ¿Es, ya, ya, ¿Ya se censó? No, digo. Ok. I would like to thank Juan, I would like to thank Juan Vega for the opportunity of joining him. Uh, uh, Professor Hector <coughs> Fixierro with Wauchio and my fellow researchers in this occasion, in which we will talk about the book A Common Theory of Judicial Review. I have to say that it, it has been a delightful experience to read such a great book. With no further ado, I would like to begin pointing out some important aspects of the book. First of all, one would show points that objection to the adoption of charters is the core democratic argument. Roughly, the argument is this. Democratic principle is seriously compromised if unelected and politically unaccountable judges are left with the task of fleshing out the moral limits of the moral rights the charters came to guarantee and then applying these rights against legislation duly passed by democratically accountable bodies like parliaments and the provincial legislature. How could allowing the duly considered judgments of the people representatives to be defeated by the action of a small group of judges sitting in appeals court possibly to reconcile with democracy? Uh, one of the most principal uh, objeciones que se hacen a, a, a la actividad de los jueces es, eh, es el argumento democrático. Se dice que los jueces eh, son un grupo de, eh, es un cuerpo no representativo eh, que difícilmente bajo un argumento democrático podría <coughs> contradecir la decisión de una asamblea, por ejemplo. There are no serious objection. It is dangerous because considerable political power is now vested in a small group of unaccountable judges sitting in appeals courts. The unfairness of this is only compounded by the fact that the judges can almost never demonstrate that their decisions are any better at honoring the relevant church of rights than the democratically chosen decision they have placed. In conclusion, judicial review under a charter of rights threatens democracy and relies on outmoded views about the nature of moral rights. Walucho says that apparently fatal problems become much more manageable if we adopt an alternative conception according to which charters represent a mixture of only a very modest per commitment combined with a considerable measure of humility. Eh, Walucho dice, eh, en general, que, este, que podemos encontrar una respuesta si eh, adoptamos una, posi una posición que combine, una, una, una concepción alternativa, que combine que sea una mezcla de eh, modestos, eh, eh, modestas guías predeterminadas con una considerable muestra de eh, humildad. Constitutionalism is the idea that the powers of government can and ought to be limited. The limitation imposed by constitution comes in a variety of forms. Some of these are legal, as in a constitutional in twain shorter, while others can be a matter of political conventions. In the book, Walucho examines the limits that are imposed on power. Constitutional conventions, entrenchment, of rights, the necessity of separation of powers, in this point, for example, while we chose concludes that there is nothing conceptually incoherent in thinking that there could be constitutional limitations without a separation of powers. While we chose also examine the need for a written constitution, and he may, and he may cause pause in thinking on this necessity. In addition, while we show also revise what constitutional interpretation is, and which are the main constitutional interpretation theories. As Walucho says, theories of constitutional interpretation are, are many, but they have to part attention on the following factors. 
meaning, intention, precedent, and theory. This is not the place to discuss, to discuss each of these theories. Bueno, Juan revisa en su libro una gran variedad de temas, muchos de ellos eh, de, una, de una gran envergadura, de un, de un gran interés. Eh, por ejemplo, una, revisa la necesidad de eh, la separación de, 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 de poderes, la necesidad de tener o no un, un, una carta de derechos. Eh, las teorías, las principales teorías de interpretación que se examinan en, en, en en detalle, además de una, de una manera muy, muy controversial y, eh, y, y filosófica. Now we arrive to our main question. Why a democratic society up in favor of a far entrenched charge of rights? The most important reason is, of course, protection of minority interests and rights. For example, Majority voting procedures will tend to marginalize minority interests. These needs often extend to individual person as well. Also, charter could be revised by judges. The role, of, the role and expectation of judges are decidedly, decidedly different. Judges are by virtue of the station far less vulnerable, says Guanucho to the forces and expectations under which every legislature are forced to labor. One of the main advocates of charter of rights is Dworkin, who says that the charter has the capacity to establish the basic principles, the basic values, and beliefs, beliefs which hold a nation together. Certainly, this kind of declaration is contested by the critics' case. In this respect, Waldron's critics represent the most serious challenge to judicial review. The main problem is one that Waldron highlights to great effect. No theory of political morality has ever stood the non-reasonable disagreement test, and there, is, and there is little hope that one ever will, says Waldron. Una de las principales críticas a, a la a la revisión judicial viene de Waldron, quien, por ejemplo, entre muchos argumentos que se examinan en el, li en el libro, señala que <coughs> no es posible alcanzar un acuerdo definitivo, un acuerdo moral definitivo sobre los principios del, del, de la Carta de Derechos. Waldron says that instead of discovering a basis upon which the notion of rational free commitment to a stable fixed point of moral agreement could, could be based, we will explore an alternative account of charter and the role they aspire to play. Charters are far from aspiring to set fixed points. Instead, what we should suggest that we view charters as representing a mixture of only very modest pre-commitments combined with a considerable measure of, of humility about the limits of the limits of our moral knowledge. Paluccio reflects on the it was metaphor of the Constitution as a living tree. That is to say, a charter is a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits. Paluccio also revised some issues that have been highlighted by her in relation to rules. For example, at the effect of of a regime of primary social rules is what Howard calls the static quality of rules. Under these systems, rules normally suffer a normal process of growth and decay. Hart, who is quoted by Walucho, was also aware that the promise of law is purchased at a potentially heavy cost that a community's law will war with its morality or with the man of wisdom, critical morality, or common sense. This was plainly the case in many Western nations, for example, Spain and the UK, whose government decided to contribute to the 2003 American invasion of Iraq. Another hazard of legal regulation highlighted by Hodge arise from the means by which law, by which law communicate its expectations, general rules. 
Facts on such as ignorance of facts in the terminacy of aim, evolving technologies, changing social context, and so on, will lead upon applications of specific cases to uncertain or unacceptable results. In order to overcome many of these problems, one shall propose to adopt a common law me method of judicial review. Se reflexiona, se reflexiona en, en, y, y se nutre la reflexión de Wauwitz en algunas de, de las observaciones que, que Hart destaca, Hart destaca eh, y, y problemas principales que Hart destaca de los este, sistemas normativos, eh, tales como la excesiva estabilidad de las normas, por ejemplo, eh, los costos, los altos costos que implica un sistema legal, eh, como puede ser que la ley exista y la población no lo acepte, tal y como sucedió, por ejemplo, con la guerra de Irak, en, concretamente en el Reino Unido y en España, donde la población no aceptaba esto. Y además con las expectaciones que genera el sistema legal. Las, son grandes, normalmente las reglas que generan grandes expectativas y posibilidades de resolver prácticamente todos los problemas. Esto parece ser muy difícil. Eh, Wallow Show finalmente propone un, un método de revisión judicial en el cual consideremos al, a la Constitución como un árbol vivo, ¿sí? a Living Tree, que es un caso que se obtiene eh, de un juez inglés eh, sobre un caso canadiense. As Wallow Show points out, the common law does, does in a way with rules entirely. The reason is simple. Common law rules are revisable at point of application for new cases, new cases of fear. The point remains that the common law has a long established history with which lawyers are familiar of successful combining in various ways, fixity with adaptability. If so, we might, we might look at the common law as a model for understanding tortures and the roles they are capable of playing. In its idea form, the top model, the top down model conceptualized, says Wallachow, the lawmaking enterprise as the tag of stating a comprehensive system of detail, precise rules grounded in a sound moral theory and designed to cover every situation to be regulated. It is the formalist idea of precise rules announced in advance and applied with no further need of law creating activity on the part of adjudicators. In contrast with the top down model, the bottom up model of legal regulation lies at the other end of the spectrum of possibilities, possibilities of legal regulation. This is the model condemned by Ben, and this is the model criticized by Benham and celebrated by Blackstone and other proponents of common law approach. A second important lesson we have learned is that there are different modes of legal regulation, in particular, different methods of attempting to deal with the circumstances of rulemaking. Whichever mode or combining of modes is employed, however, too far to make indisputable. I'm quoting uh, one or two. A, we cannot always foresee the results to which general rules will lead, and B, it would be foolish to ignore this point in thinking about how they to design our legal institution. One or two believes that it is possible to combine moral conditions with an effective rule, for example, in addition, it is possible to maintain an acceptable level of antecedent guidance while pursuing some version of the bottom-up model. <coughs> Our choices are not between the rule fetishism represented by the formalist idea and a virtual return to pro-legal society. Waluto says that the common law conception represents a, ca a kind of Copernican revolution in our thinking from the exact opposite sentiment from a recognition that we don't have all the answers and, and that we are well advised to design our political and legal institution in ways that are sensitive to the future of our predicament. Against Waldron and many other critics, 
charters done of necessity, of necessity embody a naive overconfidence in our judgment of political morality and an attendant belief that in this area of fundamental law, the top, the top down model can safely be pursued. In synthesis, eh, el método del common law eh, permite eh, la revisión, ¿sí? no excluye la posibilidad de reglas al interior y permite la revisión, la revisión de estas reglas cada que se presenta un caso. Eh, porque es traducir, estoy, estoy en problemas. Este, <risa> eh, se propone una, una, una eh, hasta, donde, hasta donde alcanzo a comprender, eh, el método nos sugiere la posibilidad de que los sistemas legales, los sistemas legales nacionales, por ejemplo, eh, canadiense o mexicano, tengan la, pos la posibilidad de combinar los métodos, los métodos clásicos de creación judicial con los métodos eh, propios del, del common law. No excluir el bottom up model, que es un método que al parecer viene de abajo, y este, eh, tampoco privilegiar innecesariamente el top down model, sí que es un método de creación hacia arriba propio de los países, por ejemplo, de legislación o de tradición eh, continental. Eh, esta combinación podría, podría eh, permitir eh, podría permitir dar respuesta a las principales críticas de quienes se oponen a la revisión judicial. Solamente tengo un par de preguntas finales. Eh, I have only two questions, Professor Wawisho. Eh, one is a very practical question. Eh, for, I would like to know how has the common law theory being received in a province like Quebec, where uh, the civil code tradition is so important. I would like to, to know how the, the uh, legal academic discourse, discussion has evolved. And also, uh, uh, I have a second question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in Uh, with this uh, uh, kind of mixture, sometimes sometimes it is difficult to set a kind of uh, established rules. Uh, I, I agree with that. But for example, some authors like uh, Rose set very basic principles: the first rule and the second rule. And th those rules are very general; they are not very uh, particular, I think. So, is it possible to? establish uh, in this method uh, a, a, a set of very and very basic rules. That's the question. Las preguntas son, ¿cómo ha sido recibido el, la teoría de la revisión judicial en, Cana, en, en, en una provincia como Quebec, que tiene una tradición del derecho romano codificado? Y la segunda pregunta es, ¿cuál, cómo, si es posible que que teorías como la de Rawls, que establecen principios muy básicos como primero y segundo principio de la justicia, puedan ser integradas a esta teoría de la eh, common, common Law Theory of Judicial Review. Profesor Juan Michel, it has been a pleasure to, to comment this. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias al doctor Ibarra. Uh, well, do you... Would you like to mention and comment on? Say a few quick words. First to Francisco, uh, thank you very much for the lovely uh, overview of the book. It was much more extensive and uh, uh, informative than mine was. Uh, the question of the reception of this kind of theory in, in Quebec, where they have civil law, uh, civil Roman law, uh, I haven't heard of anything, so uh, the, the, the book has just come out, um, so I'm not sure uh, what the reaction, if any, is going to be there. Um, but perhaps that, that brings me to a point that uh, Emir brought up as well, and uh, in some ways it was related to a point that Enrique made, 
the the difference between common law uh, as a as a phenomenon peculiar to England and the and the uh, systems of law that evolved from the English legal system and uh, the systems which evolved from Roman law, the civil law systems. Um, I intend my I intended my theory to be applicable to both. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I agree fully with Enrique that that the, that the contrasts that are often drawn are over overdrawn. Um, that in uh, interpreting uh, statutory rules, for example, uh, particularly rules uh, stated in very broad general language, such as one finds in a in a charter. Uh, you're going to be employing uh, the kind of reasoning as a judge that I claim typically goes on in dealing with more traditionally common law issues in common law uh, legal systems. So uh, uh, the kind of reasoning that, that, that goes on in both, in, in both systems is, I think, very, very similar because both systems face the same circumstances of rulemaking, as I call them, the, the, the kind, and the problems, the sorts of problems at heart. Hart, uh, Hart highlighted for us, and that I draw upon extensively. So, uh, so I would I would think that uh, that my colleagues in Quebec, who uh, who uh, if any of them read this book, which they may not do, uh, would find that uh, what I have to say there is in fact quite applicable to their system, and, and, and uh, particularly given that they share the Canadian uh, Charter with us. Um, so. That uh, and maybe just to finish up that point, um, I'm not quite sure I understand, Amir, your point about there's not a common law theory of judicial review, but a general theory of constitutional democracy. If what you mean is that again, it, it's not a theory that's restricted to common law systems of of of, 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 of law, then I fully agree. As I said, I mean, I intended it to be. I intended it to be uh, applicable across the board um, to any legal system which tries to grapple with the circumstances of rulemaking in which all of us are faced. Um, when I drew upon the common law methodology, I, I called it, or the common law model, I was talking about a kind of reasoning under legal norms that uh, that is uh, illustrated to to the greatest extent, perhaps, at least in theory, in the common law uh, of, of, of England and 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 the, and and the and the common law systems that have been developed from them, but uh, but but I certainly didn't mean to to import um, into my theory uh, just the common law as it as, as it exists in England. So it is a it is a general theory of constitutional democracy about what it is to have constitutional limitation. Uh, in a democracy and why this could be possibly a good thing to have and why um, why having a written charter which incorporates as as I'm sure you would all agree an element of uh, of statutory law it's kind of statutory, I mean because after all a charter is a written document uh, into uh, so sort of combine that with the uh, with, with with the with the interpretive strategies uh, and application strategies uh, that I attribute to the common law methodology, and, and I certainly didn't want to didn't want to suggest that in dealing with charter cases, judges are just doing the same thing that judges do in say tort cases in, in common law jurisdictions, because there is at le there are at least two notable n notable differences. First of all, we're dealing with the Constitution here, and secondly, we've got written word here, R written law which has a kind of fixity that needs to be dealt with. And, uh, and written words have meanings. And uh, these, these must be, the, 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 that fact must be recognized. Whereas when it comes to ordinary common law, such as in tort, you don't have the canonical text there that, that, that restrains the reasoning in the same way. So in calling it a common law theory of judicial review, I didn't mean me didn't mean in any in any way to minimize the effect that the writtenness has uh, on the on, on how on how constitutional limitation is to be understood in these contexts. Which perhaps brings me now to Francisco's second point. Um, I'm not again I'm not quite sure I understood it, but uh, the, the talk about Rawls and the basic principles. 
uh, whether there's a, I think you asked, is it possible that to set very basic rules or principles on my theory to which, and if, and if I understand you correctly, the answer is yes, of course, uh, that's in fact what the Charter does, I think. The, the Charter sets very basic principles like equality and free expression and so on. And as I was saying a moment ago, the words have meaning, uh, and, these, and these constrain, and, and there are limits to what one can do with those words. Uh, they set very general principles. Now, their understanding, um, I mean, even Rawls principles can, can, be, can be subject to, to controversy about their exact meaning. Uh, those very basic principles that one finds in the Charter are, are uh, as I said, uh, um, the, 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 they're, they're set by the meaning of the words and our common understandings of what those words mean within our particular community in which, in which we find ourselves with our particular charter, and importantly by judicial precedents uh, concerning what the implications of those principles are, which again develop the meaning further. Uh, so, so you do have you do have a considerable amount of fixity. In, in, in the theory that I'm proposing, um, it's not all just adaptability. It, there's, there's, it, I'm trying to bring together the fixity of written law and uh, with the adaptability, but the disciplined adaptability, I keep insisting throughout the book, of common law methodology. And all these factors come in to establish some pretty fixed, uh, rules under the Constitution which, uh, which make a constitutional document understood in this way quite different from, say, the rules of tort in, in common law jurisdictions where there's a much more, uh, there's much more flexibility, I think, than, uh, if only because there are no canonical texts. Um, so yes, I do, I, I do think there is poss there is the possibility of very basic rules. Although, if what you mean is, are, are there very basic rules which everybody can agree on in, 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 in a particular community uh, without any, any dispute, no, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, uh, there, perhaps, Waldron has a point that it is, unfortunately, disagreement all the way down. Um, uh, I guess that's all I really had to say in response. I hope I managed to address your most important questions, at any rate. Thank and, oh, sorry, may I will say one further thing. I really appreciate your, 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 your efforts. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to you, and uh, you uh, were also very generous in your, in your assessment and, uh, of, of the book and uh, raised some interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, will? No sé si alguien quiere hacer un comentario o sugerencia, yo me animo a traducir si quiere que plantearlo en español o para plantearse al doctor Juan Chao o alguno de los ponentes, no sé si existe algún comentario o sugerencia de parte de ustedes, en español o en inglés. Si no hay entonces preguntas, cerramos aquí. Agradeciéndole precisamente al doctor Francisco Ibarra, al doctor Cáceres y a Imen, y sobre todo al, al profesor Walu Chao, el, el tiempo y a ustedes también la asistencia. Gracias y nos vemos pronto. Thank you very much, Will. Oh, thank you. <laughs>